Hello and welcome back to another episode of Armchair Analyst, the only podcast that thinks the away goal rule should be replaced with bonus points for bicycle games. My name is Cameron McDonald, and I spent three years working as an FA licensed intermediary here in the UK. My co-host Rupert Meadows has written a broadcast about all things football on platforms such as TalkSport Radio and Gifford Sport. But above all else, we're fans. Yeah, thanks for that, Cam. A hat-trick of finals over the past week with the Champions League and Europa League coming to an end, as well as the Championship playoff finals determining the third team to be promoted to the Premier League next season. We'll be having a look at some of our own predictions for the table that we made at the start of this season and hopefully learn from our mistakes before we do it for next season. As always, timestamps are in the description and starting us off was the news that UEFA are set to do away with the away goals rule. Yeah, this was a rule that came out at the end of last week. Um, This is one of the um, subsidiary commissions of UEFA. It still has to be approved by the executive uh, committee, but it is sort of looking at removing the away goal things that we see in European uh, knockout stages. Obviously, that being when you score a goal away from home, it's worth double. Um, And it's really fostered an interesting conversation because I think a lot of people are sort of still feeling it out, what they think about it. For me, I know that when I heard it, I sort of had to sit and think before I put my opinion to to paper or or, or to broadcast because I was like, how do I feel about this? Um, Because I think with away goals, there are a lot of positives and also a lot of negatives. Obviously, one of the big cries that people who are against it have said is, you you know, it's really unfair that some teams get this advantage. And especially if it goes to extra time, you get an extra half hour to score a sort of double goal. And then some people have said, no, but it's what makes these games exciting. And other people have said, well, it's what makes them not exciting. Because if an away team wins, then they just try and sit back. So there's a lot to be said back and forth. What what was your take on the whole away goal scrapping thing? I guess... From my perspective, the main thing that I thought when I saw this was just, is it is the is there anything really wrong with the system? And personally, I don't think so. I kind of get the argument that, yes, maybe if you go into extra time, you have a bit of an advantage, but I think that's fairly negligible. It's only 15-minute halves each way. That's not really enough time to build up that much more momentum as a result of being the home team. I, I kind of just feel like... There have been so many exciting, exciting moments in the Champions League over the last few years. You know, think like Liverpool, Barcelona to Ajax, Real Madrid. And I just don't really feel like that that needs to be different. Yeah, and also I suppose my biggest axe to grind with the away goals rule is the extra time thing. But some people have suggested, Jamie Carragher was, was one prominent figure who sort of said, well, you don't really have an advantage because you still have an away goal, but the other team has the fans at their back in ordinary years anyway. Um, I don't know if I 100% agree with that. I do still think the ability to sort of score one goal and it to count to for an extra half hour is quite a fairly large advantage. But I do think that the away goals rule, generally speaking, is just quite good because it. one of the things that it does is it introduces this sort of not... What's the word I'm looking for? It's like this do-or-die atmosphere to these games that you don't really see anywhere else in football. There was this... Um, the chief intelligence officer for this football intelligence group called 21st Group who talked about how... What makes away goals so interesting is that they introduce something in football that doesn't otherwise happen. Usually, in football, in any normal competition, one goal can only ever turn a draw into a win or a, or a defeat into a draw. Whereas the away goals rule does give the Champions League and indeed the Europa League that sort of like knife edge excitement of of going right. One goal can completely turn things around, and we've seen so many of those over the years of just sort of one goal. Um, you know, like in the remontada, for example, changing everything and just really galvanizing teams, especially if they need to fight back and getting that away goal. So I, I'm really a big fan of it. Um, I do understand why UEFA have gone for it. Obviously, their thought is that, you know, the more games go to penalties, the more sort of exciting it is for the neutral. And I I sympathise with that to a degree, but I also think away goals can inject a lot of excitement into the game. Yeah, and look, I I also kind of... I always kind of feel like this has maybe come a year too late because the only real justification that I can think of to want to do this now is because some, some clubs are unable to play at home but still have to play away. So they get hit with a double whammy of, of not really getting the home advantage, but still, do you know what I mean? So I, I could see that having been done during COVID times, but we're coming out of that now. And I I, I recognise this is just my opinion because I do feel like it's, it's quite a divisive topic. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't see anything really wrong with that. I also just think, you know, if you're going into extra time and you're away, you, you kind of have like a golden goal moment because... It's unlikely that the opposition is going to score two goals in extra time. So if you get one goal, that's kind of tantamount to you having won the game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what gives it that sort of sort of knife edge, um, knife edge effect, which is you know, something that's very exciting. 
I just think, yeah, it, it leads to more more of those exciting dynamic moments, more of those like cup run moments. And yeah, I for one always want to embrace those kind of uh, ideas when it comes to like knockout competitions. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, I do think it's funny that you mentioned that sort of like, oh, it would have made a lot of sense for UEFA to do it maybe this season, which I, I don't disagree with because obviously the home advantage has been less of a, an ever-present thing. But it's just like, what made me chuckle there is the idea that UEFA are doing this at all for the benefit of the game. They're doing it because they want to sell more advert time and they want the games to be longer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is absolutely true. And also the other funny thing where you're like, haha, wouldn't that be nice? Is like, obviously they're just never going to move that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think... I hope now, because it still does have to be sort of approved by the Executive Commission, there's been quite a few people talking against it, and I think generally speaking, most people are fans of away goals. It'd be interesting to see, I mean, you know, my the only podcast, I wouldn't mind if Bicycle Kicks were now worth double, if they want to introduce that, that'd be great, that'll encourage some better football. <laughs> but um, I, I do hope that away goals, for the, for the most part, are here to stay. I wouldn't mind if they got abolished for the last half hour, but outside of that... Yeah, fair. I, I agree with that. What about a nice little uh, basketball ruling? All goals inside the box are worth two, and then outside the box are worth three. That see, that would be great if they had some sort of like special. If extra time usually is so boring because it's just like 50, 50 minutes, you can't really get that into the game. A lot of the time, it's quite cagey. If you suddenly made that rule a change, is that away goals no longer count in extra time? But anyone who scores outside the box, I'd be there for that. <laughs> what about? What about the, the centre-back partnership have to tie both of their legs together? <laughs> <laughs> these, Just the centre-back partnership are both playing a three-legged race. <laughs> great, great suggestions all. Um, shall we move into looking at some of the Euro, uh, UEFA competitions that happened this year, starting with the Champions League final? Yeah, so obviously... Um, you know, something that presumably a lot of our listeners will have watched um, and kind of a weird game in that it kind of flattered to deceive at times. It felt exciting, but then when you think about it, not really a lot happened. Yeah, I think it was a lot of people were making drawing the comparison between this game and the last All English Champions League final between Spurs and Liverpool. And I think it was immediately apparent in the first sort of half hour that this was a, a game of much higher... I don't want to say quality, because Liverpool were a very good side that year, but it was sort of two teams that were... You know people sometimes talk about a really exciting nil-nil? I did feel excited by this game, even when there weren't lots of goals happening. There was lots happening. It was sort of a, a good tactical clash. Um, but I just think, ultimately... I mean, we talked about... Um, I think I said a couple of weeks ago, the way Man City lose this game is if they beat themselves. And then Raheem Sterling came out and said the same thing. And at that moment, I texted you and I was like, well, Chelsea have now won it. Sterling has said that. That's quite a cocky thing for a player to say. Um, And ironically, part of the reason City lost was because they played Raheem Sterling. I mean, firstly that, yeah, which is in itself quite funny. Um, The second part is, I feel like my response was kind of like, is Sterling anti-Pep? Does Sterling recognise that really the only way that they were going to lose is if, like, I don't know, he he just decided to go for some really rogue formation and trip themselves up as a result? Because, I mean, that is what happened. He wasn't wrong. City did lose this game. I think that the weird part for me was just because, obviously, it's it's the, the biggest stage in club football. But at the same time, neither team played particularly well. Obviously, Chelsea defended really well um, and, you know, Players like N'Golo Kante put in unbelievable performances. But really, neither team were, were anywhere near their best. And as a result, that's kind of why it felt a little underwhelming. Yeah, I agree. I think the difference there is that I think Chelsea have a lot of excuses for not having played their best. Firstly, this manager's only been with them for five months. He's sort of still getting to grips with a lot of how these players work and what formations work best and what system he wants to play them with. For example, we saw you know Timo Werner start again and have another absolutely shocking game. You wouldn't be surprised if a few more months into Tuchel's, you know, chance and once he's had a proper window, he doesn't have to resort to to a player like that. And also, of course, the big thing that makes it easy to not criticise Chelsea for not playing at their best, they did win the game. On the other hand, you've got Manchester City who have been working with that manager and that main core of players for the better part of four years. And they just came out with a system that... I, I want to say no one was expecting, but in a way, I think we were all expecting Pep to do something like this. 60 games they've played this season. In 59 of those 60 games, they've started one of Rodri or Fernandinho. And the one game they chose to not do it in was the Champions League final. Very arguably the biggest game in Manchester City's history. Yeah, it, it does just baffle. Uh, I, I personally did not really understand a lot of Pep's decisions. I mean, as we said, we kind of alluded to it already, like, 
Why why did Sterling start? He hasn't been starting in these knockout competitions. And in my mind, that was because Pep didn't trust him. And then he's decided to bring him in for the final on the same day that the club say that they want to sell him. That that just completely threw me off. And Noah Aguero was mad. Obviously, this is like the one game all season, yeah, where they didn't start one of Fernandinho or Rodri. And it just, none of it made sense. I don't even know why you'd start Zinchenko over Cancelo. And I, and I get why, that's why I get that Zinchenko has been playing in the Champions League, but I still just thought that was a weird decision. It was a very weird decision, especially, you know, a lot of these decisions, well, the, the defensive mid thing was weird. I mean, I, <laughs> I looked at that, that 11 when it came out and I was like, Man City are playing four attacking midfielders and so of you know attacking sort of winger slash midfielders. No DM, no striker. At a certain point, if you're reinventing the wheel but you're making it shape like a square, you're not you're not the mastermind you think you are. Especially against Chelsea, who all season have played with some variation of the same sort of two attacking midfielders behind a striker. For players like Mason Mount and Angolo Kante, the game could not have been easier. And the goal that Chelsea did score, it was 45 yards that Mason Mount's pass went uninterrupted until it went to Kai Havertz and then who was you know arguably a little bit lucky that he was sort of able to round Edison there was a little bit of a deflection but I thought that in a lot of ways Chelsea were unlucky not to have scored more yeah I mean definitely Timo Werner missed a couple of chances and and they got themselves into good positions quite a few times and there was definitely a point where you kind of looked at the game and thought will they rue their misses but City just never really fully got going. I mean, City also, to be fair to them, got themselves in some good positions and you could kind of see Pep's tactics working a little bit in the sense that their goal seemed to be to kind of overload the attacking final third, hit them in the kind of the wide channels and get in between the the centre-back and and the wing-back on both sides. And, you know, they push a lot up their left-hand side, which has been kind of the crucial side for them all season. And I think... Just a combination of the fact that Chelsea are actually really strong defensively on the right-hand side. I think, you know, Reese James plus Azpilicueta as a combination have worked really well all season. Tough to beat, yeah. Um, Combined with the fact that they didn't have any sort of consistent presence in the box because they were fielding all these attacking midfielders. So they got themselves into a couple of really good positions, but Chelsea were able to do some really good last-ditch defending and there just wasn't that, that player there to get on the end of any you know anything that that might have fallen out at random but that's the thing exactly is that city did really really well to progress the ball into those areas on a number of different occasions but pretty much every single time that happened the player in question would look up see no one in the center and would have either already instinctively cut back to no one or they would have not cut back they'd they'd go okay well i've spent all this time progressing the ball i've now got to play back to my fullback so it was just one of those things where i was like you've it seems really simple, but and they have done fairly well with it for the most part this season, but not playing a striker really hurt them this season. And I think it's one of those things we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Chelsea's FA Cup loss to Leicester. And we looked at that and we said, you know, oh, what can this tell us about Chelsea in this Champions League final? What strengths will they work on? What weaknesses will they work on? But something maybe that we left out that would have also been a good sort of comparison to teach us about a team was Man City's performance against Spurs in the Carabao Cup final. And I think we looked at that game and a lot of people looked at that game and went, If City had been playing a team that was slightly better than Spurs, they might not have got away with this. They won very late in the day against a team that, on paper, they're miles better than because they just didn't want to do something as simple as playing a striker and it really hurt them all day. If they play a better team than Spurs, will they get their noses bloodied? And they were here. And and their noses were bloodied. Yeah, I I just... That's the other part, is that if you're not going to start a striker, you can't play Kevin De Bruyne as a false nine because, yes, he's good anywhere, but... He's so, so good at picking up the ball in midfield and turning and driving and creating from wide. And he's just not able to do that if that's where he's being played. So you're just not getting anywhere near what you could get out of him in a different system. I just, yeah, I mean, it really was just an exercise in in Pep going, you know, steps too far to try and win the tactical battle. And I kind of always had the the idea in my head that Chelsea could win just because I, I always feel like, Chelsea have a decent track record against Man City and I think that they can kind of beat them over the course of 90 minutes at any time. Um, Mm. They've produced quite a few upsets over the years. Um, I remember, I think it was maybe like 13, 14 or 12, 13 when City were absolutely flying and Chelsea kept them to a um, a 1-0 win. It was the the debut of Nemanja Matic when he'd just come back to the club 
after January. Mm. And they really managed to like break up City's momentum. And they've had a couple of moments in the last kind of seven or eight years where they have just shown themselves to be quite a good fit for Man City because you know they're, they're historically a really good side on the counter and City definitely are a side that overload. And without the presence of someone like Fernandinho, they're just always going to struggle. And they haven't replaced Fernandinho. As good as Rodri is, he, it takes a really special player to, to do the role that Fernandinho used to do. So I, no, I kind yeah, of always as, fancy... As good as Rodri is or Fernandinho is, Pep didn't trust you to start this game. And I just think it's well, one of those, I mean, like, Chelsea, yeah. Chelsea, Chelsea cool. are a good fit for City, and, and Chelsea do play very well. And I say this not at all to strip anything away from Chelsea's win, because there were some players that I'll mention specifically in a second who are absolutely exceptional. But, like, one of the big narratives after this game was people going, oh, you know, N'Golo Kante, one of the best midfields in the world. Like, he absolutely ran this game. And that's absolutely true, all of that. And he did do really, really well. It wasn't, you know, it, it didn't hurt that no one was contesting him in the midfield. I'm sure he still would have put in an absolutely goated performance because that's just how good he is as a player. And we've seen that sort of at the back end of the season, them coming back from injury and that sort of thing. And his whole career since winning the league with Leicester has just been, you know, strength to strength to strength. But they didn't need to make it that easy for him. Yeah, true. I mean, it, it has definitely felt like the first thoughts of everyone have, have been, why, why Pep? Literally, why? And then the second thoughts were Chelsea's defence was really good and Golo Kanzi is, is unreal. But exactly, yeah. Chelsea's defence was really good. They were also not playing as a striker for the vast majority of that game. So yeah, not to take anything Chelsea. away from, <laughs> from, from Chelsea's defence because they were great, but also <laughs> the man who's... The, the position that is intended to test defenders wasn't represented by City for the better part of 60 minutes. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, I do kind of feel like this... This does encapsulate Man City's season in a bit of a nutshell, just because they have often pulled out some really good results, but they were never far from an upset loss. And that was because for a lot of this season, they were without some of their key players. They were either playing Gabriel Jesus up front, who who doesn't you know, play obviously as well as someone like Aguero does, or they were playing without a striker. And they got away with it a fair amount, but a lot of the time they didn't. And you know that's why sometimes... They they did just have these upset results and they were nowhere near the 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 weaponous you know formid, uh, formidableness of someone like Liverpool the season before or even City the season before that. Yeah, the, the whole season the, the story about them has been how good they've been defensively, not sort of so much going forward. Although they still do have a lot of those players, but it's been a lot more of a one nil City uh, season for City than it has the usual sort of five one or five two type thing. Yeah, for sure, and. You know, there's, and I guess, you know, credit to, I guess, you know, Kai Havertz, as you said, he was a little lucky, but also credit to Timo Werner making a great run to to split the the centre-backs. And yeah, I guess just, it, it could have happened on any given day that City would win, but they just didn't set up the correct way and they got punished for it. They absolutely did. Um, I think just to sort of wrap it up, how funny is it that Thomas Tuchel became Chelsea manager um, you know, obviously about five months ago or however long it was because he was sacked by PSG because they didn't think he was the man to win them the Champions League <laughs> and within the same season he's won the Champions League for someone else I mean you gotta love it you, it's <laughs> it, they surely are just ruining the day in the same way that they're like sorry Cavani you're not good enough up front and Cavani's now gone to another club and just done bits um, <laughs> it does feel yeah, like then, PSG have quite a short fuse I, I suppose with the Cavani thing is it's like that one is less, because there are a lot of good strikers in any given season. There's only one manager that wins the Champions League each season, and it's the one that they sacked for not being able to win the Champions League. True, true. It, uh, yeah, I'm enjoying the irony, that's for sure. It's a, a very irony. Do you think that now, because of this you know, result, we're going to see Man City go a bit crazy in the window? I think that... Honestly, I haven't really thought about that in terms of, you know, what does City's season look like next year? I mean, obviously, it's it's almost becoming like a a maniacal thing for Pep, <laughs> just because he, it's just such a, a thorn in his side that he's not been successful in the Champions League since Barcelona, since Messi. So, uh, I mean, and, and Man City haven't won the Champions League yet. So, I, I wouldn't be surprised if... They do try and sign another couple of people. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a little bit of a dip next season and then they come back with with full, full force 
in maybe the 2022-23 season, and then they're really challenging for the Champions League. Um, but to, I mean, they, they've thinking. got some real revamp that needs doing. I mean, we've talked about a bunch of positions where they need to strengthen. So I, I think they probably will pick up the likes of someone like Harry Kane, and they will pick up, um, you know, a, a really solid defence midfielder. So yeah, I, I could. They're definitely going to spend, I think, 100 plus million. For sure. <laughs> well, that, that that was my thinking up till now, because like. It, as soon as the final whistle happened and Man City lost it, so many people, largely City fans, but like a lot of other people who are just looking at the facts, will go, "Yeah, Man City won't sign Harry Kane. It's just not really in their in their model. They spend a lot of money, but they don't really spend too much money on one player." And as soon as that final whistle happened, I was like, "That's Harry Kane confirmed, and very possibly Jack Grealish as well." Because City at the start of the season, it did look like this was the year that they were going to. Obviously, they've been such a fantastic team domestically, but this was going to be the year that they really sort of enshrined themselves among the great teams in the games to win a. a double, a triple, or quadruple, maybe even the quintuple people were talking about for a long part of the season. And they have still won, you know, the league and the Carabao Cup, but the Carabao Cup is the fourth or, or fifth most important trophy that, you, that you're in for there. Um, and the Champions League was was the big one. Obviously, the Premier League is still great, but they've won it quite a few times. Now. The Champions League was sort of the jewel of their season and what would have been the one to make it, you know, better than anyone they've had so far. And so when they failed at the last hurdle with that team that everyone's been looking at and been going, oh, they, they could do the, the quintuple or the quadruple, I was thinking, like, they are just going to go nuts now. And just they, they thought they'd thrown everything at the at the wall and it hadn't worked. Now they're really going to go for it. Yeah, I, I to be fair, I could really see it, see it happening as well. And, and they would look very scary with uh, Harry Kane up front. And with, with a nice new bolstered midfield, um, that idea definitely scares the daylights out of me. Um, but <laughs> you'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, looking at the other European final with another disappointing Mancunian side uh, falling short. Um, and I wonder if that's... I haven't really looked this up, but I wonder how many times you've had a team from either year losing the final. It's probably happened to like Real and, Atl- and Atletico before, I assume. I... The only one I can think of off the top of my head is um, two oh, years no, no. ago with with Liverpool beating Tottenham and then Chelsea beating Arsenal. So yeah, there's there's two London teams. So that's so there's one. I wonder how many of those there have been. I imagine probably Madrid would be have had to gun to my head guess would be would be my other guess for that. But um, yeah, no, I mean this was a, another bit of a disappointing game from Manchester United. It was a disappointing game for more reasons than one. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, we can talk about what happened on the pitch. I think it was yet another game where, you know, Bruno Fernandes in big games, man. I mean, he, he's a great player, but if it's not a penalty against Southampton, can he get the goals that count? And then Marcus Rashford had a had a shocker as well. But one of the things that I thought was just equal parts hilarious and sorrowful about this game was just how unbelievably biased the coverage was. And I know we were watching it in England. And Do you it's know like what? I actually team. felt exactly the same thing, yeah. Especially with the penalties. <laughs> they were like... With the penalties. <laughs> and I was just like, Villarreal, who have done enough to, to get to this this Europa League final, they've, they've on their own merits, got to the same point in, in the tournament as Manchester United. It's not that they've been drawn in the round of 16 and it's a, it's a huge mismatch. They've also beaten some big teams to get here on, on their way. And the sort of triumvirate of Paul Scholes, Rio Ferdinand and Owen Hargreaves were all just sort of like, yeah, I mean, this team's nothing really. Like, this this is a given for Manchester United. And it was another one of those situations where I was like, you're taking this as red, and I think you might lose now. Yeah, I know what you mean. As soon as as soon as you feel like some, something's been overlooked, you're like, well, this may come back to bite you. But during the penalties, they were literally just pure fans. There was nothing else to it. There was, they literally, everything, all sort of like... Um, impartiality was just completely out the window. They were going like, go on, he's going to get in. He's going to get in. Yes! Go on, Rashford! <laughs> Um, so... penalties I don't mind that so much though because penalties are as close as a, a thing to just like a, a random 50-50 as you can get in football obviously there's some skill to it but a lot of it is just like bottle on the day and things like that oh, but just the, the biasness just... of being like yeah Villarreal and nothing United will have yeah I mean that was also well, it was, bad it, it was the bias pre-match and, and during the match and also obviously Robbie Savage was on commentary who's a you know United former youth player came through their academy it was just that, and also just, like, the lack of information about the other team. Like, the three of them just spent, like, 25 minutes talking about Manchester United, about things that any person who's been watching the Premier League this season already knows. They were like, oh, you know, Rashford loves to go into those pockets, and Bruno's going to be doing his best to pull the strings. And I was there just like, yeah, every English fan knows this. Meanwhile, you know, they weren't talking at all about Villarreal, which it would have been really interesting to have a, a bit more of an in-depth, you know, explanation on a team that 
you know, everyone knows a little bit different amounts of, but I think most English fans know less about than Manchester United. Yeah, true. I mean, I that's the other thing is like it's not like Villarreal are without their incredible like history of players um to draw on if you wanted to invite someone to come down and like be part of that punditry team surely someone like i don't know i would love to see diego forlan i don't know how good his english is but in in the in the box even someone like imagine getting raquel may next to you know all of those man u stars to talk about the game that'd be so interesting That'd be hilarious. Or even failing that, even if you want to go for like a, a sort of English face that's very recognisable to all sorts of people as they clearly want to with, with these lads, why not go for like a, a former Liverpool player or a City player or something like that, just so it's, or an Arsenal player, just so it's someone who wasn't, isn't just like on their knees for Manchester United? Because the coverage was just nowhere near balanced. Yeah, it was, uh, it was not so. I mean, it was Santi Cazola, you know, get him involved. People yeah, know who he is. Yeah, another great one. Um, but yeah, <laughs> don't, it, don't have any pundits, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, the, the, the game itself, I mean, several players went missing. Again, both of these finals, and we're going to be talking about the England squad in a little bit, both of these finals, Marcus Rashford and Raheem Sterling, have really argued themselves out of contention for the, well, in, in my opinion, anyway, I'm sure we'll see them both play under Southgate, but um, have really just not covered themselves in glory and both had shocks in their respective finals. Fernandez again, had a bit of a miss in the big game. And I think the big question mark was Solskjaer and his in-game management. It's something that we've touched on a few times this season, something that United fans have sort of been back and forth on all season, whether he's the man to take them forwards. And much like how the Champions League final was the sort of the jewel in Manchester City season, the idea that winning the Europa League would have eased all concerns is, is not quite accurate, but it was definitely seen as progress to go, OK, we've won second, we've come second and we've won the Europa League. That is progress under Raleigh. Instead, they've lost out at a final hurdle again. Obviously, this is the first final they've been in under him, but they lost four semi-finals before now. And so it's just the idea that he's not a serial loser, but he just he can't figure it out that that last bit. Well, I mean, that's where you know those big matches, both for players and for managers, is where experience really shows. And it was really like a I don't know a, a cat amongst the the, the mice with um, Unai Emery, serial winner of the Europa League against Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who hasn't really won anything. Um, especially not in Europe. So, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was definitely going to be a tough time for him, and he hasn't quite shown, as you said, his ability at that level yet. Um, and yeah, I mean, you mentioned Marcus Rashford kind of playing his way out of contention. The real loser in all this is going to be Mason Greenwood because he's now not in the the final twenty six squad. That that is true. Although I think that's more to do with injury than any anything to do with performance. Yeah, I, I don't know. It was just an interesting game. Obviously, VRL played really well. I personally love a game that goes to penalties, even though I also love away goals, but penalties in the finals, great. Um, and I think they just showed more bottle. You're right, Unai Emery again came back, and some people have sort of said he was judged too harsh in the Premier League. I would disagree with that. I think that his ability just lies in managing Spanish teams very well. He didn't do a great job at PSG, but he's done really well at Sevilla and now Villarreal. Um but one of the things you have to look at here, especially with a view to sort of looking at these pundits and how easily they sort of cast off Villarreal, seventh place team in England, oh, sorry, seventh place team in Spain beats second place in England. After all the rhetoric about, you know, oh, we're in the Champions League final again, the English teams are elite, are we maybe a little bit, are our heads a bit too big? Or was this just a bit of an anomaly? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are definitely some good examples of, uh, you know, English teams not quite fitting the bill, living up to expectations and, you know, quite a few Spanish sides that are just really experienced in Europe and are managed by people who are really experienced in Europe. So definitely we can, uh, myself included, fall into the tendency of thinking that, you know, the Premier League is this special league that is so competitive and so much stronger than any other league. And I do think that that is true to an extent because obviously the, the mindset is different here of 20th place can always beat first place. And we see that all the time happen. But it's not the case that, you know, you can say that, like, the third place English team will always be the third place Italian, the third place Spanish, the third place German, because that's clearly so often not the case. And there's a great example of that seventh place beating second place. Yeah, no, 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 exactly. And I think 
broadly speaking, yeah, United have been, certainly in the Premier League, they are second, but I think you could make the argument over the course of the whole season, maybe Chelsea have had a had better season because they did so well at the end, but in terms of just consistency, United have been at least up there, whereas Villarreal have very not, and they won here. I think it's also interesting taking into account the idea of like what it means to be a good cup team versus what it means to be a good league team, because sometimes, often when you hear sort of conversations about things like doubles and, and, and you know, even trebles or, or just, just being able to do stuff, there's not as much of an appreciation about what skills it takes to be good at a knockout tournament versus a league format. I think we've seen that, for example, with Man City, who've been wildly successful in the in the league over the last few years, but this is the first time they've made it to a Champions League final. Or Man United, who are quite good in the Premier League this season. Um, but when it came to the knockout games, obviously they got knocked out of the Champions League at first and then lost the final hurdle here um, to Villarreal. Yeah, so I think almost um, the only thing you can really say for sure is that probably on balance... Premier League teams maybe just have a little bit more money, so can have a little bit better of a squad than um, <laughs> than other sides. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, except for the fact that United had a really good squad in this game, but they just didn't use it, didn't make a sub until 100 minutes in. The in-game management from Solskjaer was, was bizarre. Um, I think both, both European finals, hilariously, were sort of characterised more by really bad decisions from one set of gaffers than the other doing really, really well. Do you think, do you think that's unfair to say? Is that ridiculous? No, I... I... I, I do kind of feel like there's definitely at least something to be said for the fact that, yeah, they, they just underperformed and at least in part lost the game of, of their own poor decision making. Yeah, no, I think so. Um, looking at a final of the last of our hat of finals where this maybe wasn't the case, um, the championship playoffs. And Rupert, I'm a man with a conundrum because what am I going to do next season when Leeds and Brentford play each other? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I feel... You know, just because you're such a Leeds fan and I'm such a Brentford fan and I also love Leeds and you also love Brentford, but I kind of feel like obliged to maybe take up the mantle of Brentford against your your Bielsa. <laughs> is, that, is that the size we're allocated? Because like you, you, say, you said that as if either of us were actually fans of either of those clubs, but to clarify, we're not. It's just that we both just love a lot about what those clubs have going on. For Leeds, it's a lot of Bielsa, but I love a lot of the players there, and I know you do as well. And similarly with Brentford, the whole sort of you know system they have, Thomas Frank I really like as well. I like a lot of the players who come through. I like the whole system of how the club is run and how they've sort of gone for an alternate way. So it's just two very likeable clubs, in my opinion, anyway. That are going to be in no, the Premier I League mean, next season, which on the one hand I'm very happy about. On the other hand, it means they play each other. I'll have to pick. It's like trying to pick your favourite <laughs> child. My heart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll we'll just have to soldier through, Cam. And I think you know, hopefully, the uh, the positives outweigh the negatives. I for one cannot wait to see Brentford in the Premier League. They've been taunting us both as as fans of the club, as in as people that like the club, um, by kind of teasing the fact that they were going to get through and going to get through. And this is what the third time in quite not, not too many years that they've been in the final of the championship of the championship playoffs. Uh, it is. And it's their 10th time in total. So they've really, they've bashed their head against the wall with this one since they were last in the Premier League, which was obviously ages and ages ago in 1946, 47, which by the way, they had not one, but two fans who were there when Brentford were last in the Premier League at that game. And I was watching that and Potter was like, oh, fair play. And Potter was like, get inside. <laughs> <laughs> go home what are you doing someone's like oh no they'll be vaccinated and I was like I don't mean the virus I mean a stiff wind could kill either of them <laughs> they were uh, some some old customers that's for sure um, <laughs> but, but yeah I think um, the main thing that I've always felt with Brentford is that I, I want them to if they go up I want them to stay up for a, for a longer than just one or two seasons so I've kind of at least tried to tell myself when I've been disappointed that they haven't quite passed that final test that maybe they weren't quite in a position to be ready to stay up. So I, I hope now that, you know, they, they've got some great players um, and they've got a great setup and their club just kind of seems to ooze stability in, in the way that they are run. So I hope that now they are able to be in a position where they can really kind of consolidate their position as a, uh, a Premier League club for at least, for at least three or four years in a row. 
You would hope so, and if, if we can, you know, obviously these things aren't always set in stone, but what we can take from last year is obviously, A, they lost in that final to Fulham, who were not exactly the most stable Premier League team this season themselves, um, so I'm not completely putting all my horse into the transitive property car, but if that's anything to go by, um, they might not have done it. And on top of that, you know, some of the players that have left them, yes, Ollie Watkins has been really, really good this season. Saeed Benrahma's had a little bit more of a, a reserved start. He sort of found his feet a little bit towards the last sort of six, seven games, but it took him a while at the very first. So maybe had he been there with, with Brentford as one of their two best players last season, it, it wouldn't have done, um, you know, he wouldn't have done as well as, as quickly. I think you've got to look at that team now and ask a few questions, um, not in terms of like bad, but just sort of look at those players and go, well, okay, Ivan Tony, he's been fantastic in the league this season. 31 goals in the regular season, 33, including the playoffs. Um, and he obviously broke that um, championship record that Glenn Murray held of 30 goals in a regular season. Yeah, but, and like 10 assists as well, which is unreal. Yeah, and like 10 assists. So in theory, he should come up and be an absolute weapon. But is he going to be more Jamie Vardy or Alexander Mitrovic or Timo Pukki? You know, so many of these players that we see, they especially for the, for the ones who play for sort of yo-yo clubs, they go down to the championship, they do amazingly, and everyone goes, oh, he's going to be absolutely fantastic when he comes up to the Premier League this season, and they get about six goals. Yeah, true. I mean, t- time will tell. It's, it's impossible to really make that prediction um, now, other than just kind of looking at the player and seeing... Um, how good he is. And it does feel like, you know, his career has kind of steadily been on the up. So hopefully he's not just a flash in the pan. We, we will see, won't we? I think um, the other thing to remember is obviously, you know, they're going to strengthen. And what you often see is kind of them, like the, the clubs that come up from the championship often like pick some of the best young stars that are in other championship teams to take with them. Um, so it'd be interesting to see who they, they pick up and, and maybe they'll get some sort of Maybe a little bit of European quality as well um, to, to bolster the ranks. But it's, yeah, it's an exciting time to be a Brentford fan. That's for sure. Yeah, and I do think, so just looking at, um, for example, just just the Ivan Tony thing there to finish the point, I think the few things you can look at that suggest that maybe he will adapt well is the fact that this season when he came to Brentford was a season where he was adapting from a league below. So he was coming from, from League One side Peterborough United and he wasted absolutely no time getting acclimatised to the Championship. So clearly he's not someone who gets too intimidated by these things and, and can settle in with new players quite instantly. Obviously the other one to look at um, as an example of what we could expect is that man Ollie Watkins who you know is the same age as Ivan Tony. They worked with the same attacking coaches and Watkins has had had a fantastic maiden season um, in the Premier League. I think he got 14 league goals, which is, you know, not bad at all, um, especially when you're playing for Aston Villa. So, yeah, I think he could be very good. There's a lot of other exciting players there. I'm really excited about Mbwemo as well, who's been really exciting in a lot of their games. It's hard sometimes to look at how Brentford have played in the Championship and go, well, based on the strength of that, they'll be really good in the Premiership because Norwich are a thing. But there are also there there are sort of former products that have left the club who have worked with that same model that same system whether it's the coach himself Thomas Frank or it's the different sort of uh, positional coaches that have gone on to do well in the Premier League um, even after a little bit of time so I I, I hope that they do well next season um, and I, again it does depend on how they strengthen the summer but I've I've I have a good feeling about them nice yeah well the feeling is mutual um, shared with me as well I thought Swansea in this game were. <laughs> what's the diplomatic word to use to use here very excitable in a lot of their challenges uh the goalkeeper included to, to give away that first penalty it was one of those that just felt like almost flipped on its head actually and i think there was a little bit of punditry chat about this about how sort of like brentford had lost last season in this game and the the two ways you can react to that are sort of let it get under your skin and be a team that always loses in finals or to build on the confidence that you've built from sort of learning from your mistakes and doing all that and Brentford were the confident team here, even though at 2-0 up, there were loads of people, myself included, going, right, now how do they lose this game? How, how do they get the ball? <laughs> they, they sort of really confidently put the game to bed, and there was no real you know, suggestion to show Swansea getting back into the game, especially after the red card. Swansea, on the other hand, were quite rash. The occasion seemed like it had caught them not off guard, but I think the players looked a little bit nervous. They looked a little bit excitable. Um and I think that that's where the match was won, really, for, for, for Brentford. Obviously, the players, um, in terms of what they did, was one part. But I thought mentality was a was a real a real force in this game. Yeah, definitely. And and I think, um, you know, Swansea, they've had a good season, but they also have a couple of really young players who just don't quite have that level of experience. And um, 
you know, obviously someone like Jay Fulton should know better at 27 to get sent off. But Mark Guahey and Ben Cabango, both 20 and 21 respectively, and they started at centre-backs. And they're both really talented players, exciting and young players. But I do think, yeah, Brentford did just seem like they had the, the edge in terms of experience. I know what you mean, though. I was definitely feeling the same. Um, it, it's funny because Brentford are one of those clubs where in the championship playoff final, they go 1-0 up and you're just thinking like, please no because you can already see the, the writing on the wall you're like I'm, I'm, not strong two enough. I'm not strong enough um but uh yeah they looks like it all kind of com- culminated for them and they managed to to finally pass that test that has long eluded them they finally did also the the Swans thing you were saying jay fulton getting sent off jay fulton got a straight red his tackle was not as bad as matt grimes in the first five minutes i thought arguably it was still a red card but i was like you're unlucky to be off if he stayed on. Yeah, I mean, I it's it's. I actually often think of it as a bit of a failing of referees, which is that they always seem a little bit reluctant to send people off in the first couple of minutes. And I get that it completely changes games, but if they deserve to be off the pitch, then send them off. It's it's that unwritten rule, isn't it? Nothing in the first half hour. You, you could stamp on someone's head, and you wouldn't get sent off. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, um, then, and then sometimes, to be fair, what that then does is then informs the referee's decision to go, oh, I've got to catch up and then send off someone else. Exactly. So, I mean, to be fair, like that is a moment where it really just could have gone either way and Brentford just got the luck of the, the dice roll. So, you know, there's always going to be a, a component of luck in, in a final or in any sort of 90 minutes. But yeah, I think Swansea can feel a little hard done by, but at the end of the day, Brentford definitely showed themselves to be the strongest side over 90 minutes. I think they deserved it, yeah. I, th- I think they, they, they played really well and they, they sort of built on what, what weaknesses they had last year to, to close this game out really, really well. Um, that is our finals. Shall we have useless trivia before we talk about the England squad? Yeah, sure thing. So I've got, I've got quite a funny story for you um, this week that I'm hoping you haven't heard before. But um, have you, by any chance, Cameron, heard of a, uh, a referee scoring in a game? Uh, I don't think so. I've heard of a ball boy scoring in a game, but referee has, has eluded me. So uh, there was once a uh, a match in um, I put it somewhere in, in like lower leagues in England uh, in um, in Bromley with the Great Bromley Cup uh, between two teams called Earls Colm and Wimpole Two Thousand. Um, so Wimpole in in two thousand. And um, during the game, which was being dominated by um, Earls Colm, they were 18-1 up. <laughs> the referee, the ball fell to him and he just decided to volley it in, <laughs> absolutely bang it into the back of the net um, and score for Wimpole. Um, he then proceeded to celebrate, running up the pitch and laughing, finding it really funny. Um, and <laughs> just just one of the most bizarre stories I've heard in terms of like referee involvement completely shamelessly just absolutely like twatted it into the net um celebrated like like any good player would do um happily didn't have too much of a bearing on the game which 18-1 at the time finished 20 to 2 um but uh he was then suspended for seven weeks by the Essex County Football Association so he decided to quit um and uh was quoted afterwards saying something along the lines of I'm glad it happened because it shows refs aren't just rule crazy robots. I mean, yeah, that one isn't definitely. I think that's uh, you know fair play. Um, my one is talking about uh, managers, the greatest managers. Of course, we just spent a little bit of time talking about the Champions League final and Thomas Tuchel at Chelsea and how he's made them such a good defensive side. He has a a great history of defensive sides um, to the to the point where only one manager has got a win by more than one goal against him in either 2020 or 2021, uh, which I'm sure, as you know and others may also know, but I just want to remind everyone, is Big Sam Allardyce. <laughs> Good old Sam, breaking records left and right. The no ultimate defiers of expectation. <laughs> Obviously, we all knew that he'd scored those those five, but no one else has even been able to get more than one, and Sam got five. That is that is a surprising and impressive statistic. Or, or For, well, I mean, f- f- five goals total, three goal margin. See, what's nice about that is that I think both managers come off really well in that story. <laughs> yeah, they really do. They really nice, do happy, ha- nice happy win all round. Well done, Big Sam. Well done, Thomas. Where are we going next? From Big Sam, are we segueing into the England squad or are we jumping into the league table? 
I think uh, I'm actually. I actually don't think we're going to have enough time to talk about the uh, the table standings. We we'll have to save that for next week, and, and let's just talk about the England squad. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Um, the England squad. I've got written <laughs> under my headlines: four right backs, Gareth. Four. That's insane. And that seems like a, a good a place as any to start with it. Um, we were all sort of debating last week. You and I had a disagreement on which right back should be left out of the squad. Everyone had their own take on whether Trent Alexander Arnold. Or, 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 uh, Trent Alexander Arnold should be in for the ease of the pundits to say his name <laughs> the um no the strength of his season relative to sort of his strength as a player um or if it should be someone else like Trippier or or Reese James that's dropped and instead he's gone for all four yeah which is somewhat surprising I mean you can kind of argue that a lot of these players can play in other positions like Trent can play in midfield Reese James can play in midfield Carl Walker can play at centre back um Trippier well, can play at left do mean, back do, do you mean as a wing back I mean a wing back or or in in centre mid. Uh, well, let's let's let's, field. let's move on to that in a second because I, w- I want to have the Alexander on midfield chat with you uh, uh, as a separate thing. But sorry, but anyway, so you're saying they're all very versatile centre backs, wing backs. Yeah, exactly. So it, yes, it is ostensibly like four right backs, but at the same time they cover about seven different positions. So I, I kind of I can understand it, but I do think that someone like. I don't know, Jesse Lingard, James Will Prowse or Ollie Watkins can all be a little disappointed that they got axed, but none of those players did. Yeah, I think it, it suggests that four right backs, it suggests that probably we'll be going for that sort of back three, back five type system and Carl Walker and Reese James will be sort of the first and second choice for the right-sided centre-back, whereas Alexander Arnold and Trippier will be the first and second choice for the, the sort of out-and-out right wing-back. Um, that's what it suggests to me anyway. What I do think is also interesting is that, you know, you mentioned there Trent Alexander-Arnold in the midfield. The midfield is, is very light. Um, there are a lot of players that have been omitted from midfield. Obviously, Jesse Lingard and James Will Prowse have both been taken out of that provisional squad, and there's plenty others that didn't even make that squad. There's not a huge amount of them, and one of the, you would expect, sort of senior names on that team sheet who is in the midfield is 30-year-old Jordan Henson, who hasn't played a game for five months. So he will be playing against Austria in the in the friendly before the Euros, and you'd imagine if he's fit, he'll be playing against Croatia. But you also wouldn't be that surprised if he's not able to play all of the games. Um, and as a result... Will we see Alexander Arnold perform in a midfield role? Well, I for one think that we're all ready for it. Collectively, as a as a football um, you know world, I'm ready for Alexander Arnold to, to make his his grand entrance in the England squad at midfield. But um, you know, time will tell whether or not Southgate's quite feeling ambitious enough. One thing I would say is that, as you say, it's quite a lighter midfield. I think this is a really ambitious squad, which I'm excited about and nervous in equal measure because. I think the right backs are just a microcosm of what we can see across the squad, which is that he's chosen a really tactically flexible, you know, bunch of players. The other um, notable inclusion is someone like Bukayo Saka, who can play pretty much anywhere across um, that left hand side from left back to to left wing and can also play, you know, in, in an attacking midfielder role on either side. So. It's exciting. I really like this idea that, you know, we're going to shape our tactics to the opposition. Obviously, that's kind of, in my mind at least, where, where all squads should should do, to, should like move towards. But I do feel a little nervous over the fact that obviously international teams don't get that long to play with each other. And typically where squads kind of achieve success is when they've got a really strong core of, you know, players from one system or one club that they can build around and we don't really have that as an England squad so yeah, I, I think that it could be our, our most exciting element and also our biggest weakness which is that we've picked this squad which is well rounded in that you know it can shift to, to match any tactic but I think we could maybe fall into the the, uh, the trap of being you know a jack of all trades master of none. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be excited about in, in this squad that also can give you pause for thought. One example for me is sort of how young the squad is. There's a lot of young kids that have been brought in that I'm really excited about seeing. I think Jude Bellingham has been fantastic for Dortmund this season and played really well for England. Bakayo Saka has had a fantastic season at a club that hasn't you know, been the easiest club to have a good season at this season. Obviously, you've got your players like Rice and Mason Mount that have been fantastic um, for, for their country before, but also you know just, just in general for their club. Um, and 
on the one hand, that's very exciting because you look at that and you go, well, you know, if these, these lads do well together, they're going to do well for a long time. But the average age of this squad is 24.69 years, which is almost a full year less than the 2018 World Cup's average of 25.48. The average age of the England squad over the last five tournaments is actually 26.4 years old. So this is a lot more squad than England usually have. And in a way, you can look at that and go, well, that's, you know, it's a bit dodgy. And on top of that, there's only three players over the age of 30, which is Henderson, Trippier and Walker. But the other way of looking at it is going, well, other than that 2018 England squad, which was also younger than that average age, the England team hasn't covered themselves in glory massively. Is there going to be an element of that fearlessness of youth that, that sort of comes forward and lifts the whole team? Maybe. It might not it might backfire, but it's something that, you know, I agree with you. It excites me and, and unnerves me in equal measure. I know what you mean. Yeah, it's... um, I, what What else is cool about that is also just the fact that you know, we might have that injection of, of young excitingness that, that doesn't really feel um, nervousness in the same way even because, you know, they're just so fresh-faced and, and eager to impress. But also just the fact that we're building something, at least I like to think so. You know, all of these players will be available for at least another tournament or two to come. So, you know, I, I for one, like the idea that all of these young players like Saka and like Rice and, um, you know, that they're all getting experience in, in a way that maybe the generation before didn't. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? Like, because the team is so young, we could achieve the exact same result as this, like with a slightly old squad, and you can be more optimistic about it. Like, if this team goes to the semis now, but doesn't win, you'll still be able to go, well, you know what, I mean, bodes well for the future. Whereas if we had sort of gone for all those much older players and got knocked out in the semis, you go, wow, and this is the result of a generation's building. <laughs> Yeah. Hey man, 2026. I've been saying it for years. Well, it's hard not to sort of have that that thought creep into your skull, obviously, with a lot of these young players, and particularly some of these young players like your Phil Foden's, who have just, you know, he's 21 now. The idea that he could keep getting better and better just only makes you feel good about about the team. Um, in terms of players that have been left out, this is a player that we talked about at the time, at the sort of, I think we're in the middle or at the back end of his, his run of form. Jesse Lingard gets omitted um, after making the, the provisional list. Is that really out of pocket from Gareth? Or is that sort of quite smart going, look, you had a really good two months, that doesn't overwrite the eight years that you had that weren't so hot? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that this is another reason why the provisional squad was quite good in a way because it did acknowledge those players that didn't make it in the end, but that, you know, are on the fringes very much so. So from my mind, Gareth Southgate, we'll obviously have talked to him about it and we have said, look, you had a really good period. I'm really excited for you going forwards. Unfortunately, you haven't quite made it because, you know, for these reasons, you only did have a red hot two months and he did kind of taper off towards the end of the season. Mm. Um, but, you know, obviously like, you're in contention. You're in my thoughts. You made that 33-man squad. I want you to push on. I want you to see this as motivating. And I, I want to talk to you next year about you being a key member of this squad. So I I, I actually don't mind it too much um, because of the way that it's happened. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And I, I do think it's funny because I probably wouldn't have had this line of thought about Jesse Lingard had you not been the one to make the point. But now every time I think about Jesse Lingard not being in the squad, my mind just immediately goes to Raheem Sterling and also, to a lesser extent now, Marcus Rashford. And I'm just like, if you guys didn't play for United and City respectively, would you even be in the squad at the moment? Or or would you even be sort of as nailed on as you apparently are? Because there was never any question mark about either of them making the squad. And ironically, in much the same sense, Jesse Lingard has not been great for a long time, but he played for Man United and got in the squad. Now he's not played for Man United. He's actually been really good, albeit for a short time, and he's not made the squad. <laughs> I thought the whole point of Gareth was supposed to be a move away from that. Well, I know what you mean in theory. I mean, I, I guess the only counter that I can think of for that, that I do feel like has some relevance, is that despite the fact that Sterling and Rashford haven't covered themselves in glory through this season, especially towards towards the latter end and these final two games that we were just talking about, they are mature players and they do have a strong voice in the dressing room and you know they've both shown themselves to be really mature characters over the last few years. So I'm actually personally quite happy that they're going to be there because I think that they're still young, relatively, but they will help guide those those younger players through. Um, so Lingard can be disappointed, I think, to be to be uh, omitted. But I just think you know the sky's the limit for him. He's made it out from under the shadow. 
I hope he stays um, you know, at West Ham. I hope that he continues to, to go from strength to strength and he'll be in next year if he keeps going the way he's going. That's very true. And that's also a really good point that I hadn't really thought much about with um with Rashford and Sterling is that despite, you know, the the big potential weakness in this squad is a lack of experience outside of your sort of Jordan Henderson's um and uh and, and Carl Walker's, certainly if you think about like experience at the top and winning things and and uh you know that, that maturity that comes with that sort of thing. Um but Marcus Rashford, certainly and Raheem Sterling are both sort of level heads. We've seen what they're like off the pitch and that can be every bit as important as having an influence on the pitch. Yeah, definitely. I mean, on balance, I think I'm pretty happy with this 26-man squad. I'm obviously devastated that James Will Prowse hasn't made the cut. Um, But apart from that, I kind of feel like you can make arguments as to why any of them haven't made it. And I think they're they're all pretty valid arguments. Ollie Watkins is the other one that can maybe be a little disappointed. But again, keep growing, keep playing well. You'll get there. That's what that's what's so cool about this thirty three squad. Um, yeah, o- o- Ollie Watkins was the same. I, th- I mean, I think when we talked about our emissions last week, you had Mason Greenwood, and I had um, I think we might have both had Bakayo Saka. And it's just not it's not so much of a oh you're not anywhere near good enough, but it's just you know keep cracking on. This is your first or second season doing it. Definitely the same for Ollie Watkins here. He's about one season in the Premier League, and it's been a great season. But I can understand why he hasn't been included, and I don't think that his non inclusion here means that he couldn't potentially have a starring role in the World Cup, for example. Well, exactly. So, you know, there's there's so much to be excited about. And personally, I am feeling pretty enthusiastic about this tournament. I don't think that we're going to go all the way. I don't think we need to set any sort of like predictions now. But it is a it is a talented young bunch of players. And so that is obviously pretty thrilling. Um, I clearly have not learned any lessons from uh, the England disappointments of, of the past. Um, I'm ready to be hurt again. <laughs> We haven't prepared these, but um, could I try and get you to give me an 11? And I'll try and give you one back if you uh, if you feel up to the task. Okay, yeah, sure thing. Let me just um, get up the uh, the full squad. So, I'll t- tell you what, you, you do that and in, in the meantime, I'll make the case for some of mine. So I think in goal, <laughs> Gareth Southgate's going to go for Jordan Pickford. I, I just, that guy has nine lives. I don't think he's been like good top quality for years and years and years. And I just think, yeah, like Everton fans seem to mostly agree with me. I, I would love it to be Dean Henderson, but he just hasn't played as many games I would have liked. So I, I will still go, go for Dean Henderson, I think. I would have loved him to play more games this season so we could see him do, you know, as well as he did the season before. I still think he has been good when he's played this season, though, and so I'd put him in there. Um, the back Yeah, I, 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 I completely agree with you. I think it kind of has to be Jordan Pickford. The only opposition to him would have been Nick Pope, but he, he's not in it injured so yeah Pickford confirmed I think it, it will be Pickford but but so so I'm saying what I would want it to be I think it will be Pickford I would like it to be Dean Henderson I I do like Dean Henderson to be fair I actually really like Sam Johnson as well but uh, for me I think just the experience of Pickford at the back is going to be good for us to have and I don't think Dean Henderson has quite played enough minutes this season and quite showed enough him, isn't it? to um, him. To, to make it over him so I actually my first choice would be Pickford uh, I'd be going for a back four, but again, that's what I would want to do. I don't think it's what uh, Southgate would do. My back four would probably be Shaw, Maguire, Stones, and I mean, if we're taking him, <laughs> I'm tempted to go for Alexander Arnold over Walker just to just to do a real one eighty. But no, I'll, I'll say Walker for the uh, for the experience. How, what are your defenders looking like? So is this is this a squad that we think he'll go for? The eleven that we think he'll go for, or what we personally would choose based off the squad? What you would choose? Um, I think that I would happens have... happens to be also what he will choose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think the main thing that... Uh, to be honest, this, this whole defence I'm not fully confident about. I do prefer like a nice 4-3-3. Three, three. That's what I think th- this squad could get a lot out of. But I do also think that we've looked so good in the past with a back five that maybe I'll stick with that. So I'll put Trent on the right. I'll put... Um, I think I want to put Luke Shaw on the left as well. And then... I want Carl Walker at right centre back, um, John Stones in the middle, and I'll put Harry Maguire at left left centre back. Pretty safe. Uh, so for my midfield three, I'm going to go for an extremely young midfield three, but it's one I think that could handle it. I'm going to go for uh, Declan Rice, 
uh, sitting back in the defensive mid, and then Jude Bellingham and Mason Mount uh, as my uh, as my midfield three being finished off. Very nice. I mean, I I think I want to go for um, Rice and Mount. I think. Yeah, I think that makes sense if you're if you're playing a two in midfield and up front for me. To to start or not to start Phil Foden is such a difficult question. I'm going to uh, start him. Well, I'm going to put Greenish on the I'm left. Gonna... Because you know how much I love Andre Greenish. Yeah. It's got to be Harry Kane up front. But then do you play Foden or Sancho? I mean, I, I think maybe I'm a little biased just because I don't watch as many Dortmund games as I do City games. But I'm, I'm going to start with Foden, Grealish and, and Kane. Yeah, I think I would as well. I think I would as well. F- Foden is, has, has earned his way into that team, I think. <laughs> no Sterling for either of us. No Rashford for either of us. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, kids. But they, 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 uh, you, they can you guys can in the just dressing be... room. <laughs> Yeah, nice little encouraging presences in, in the back rooms. <laughs> Marcus Rashford also, and Raheem Sterling's jobs. Actually, Mason Greenwood isn't going now, but Raheem Sterling's biggest job at the, the World Cup, oh, sorry, the Euros even, should be making sure that Phil Foden doesn't sneak out to try and <laughs> to try and see any birds. <laughs> to be fair, I'm not going to argue with you there. I mean, one thing I will say, we have a thrilling bench. Um, like, I back any of these players to come on and, and make an impact. I think Marcus Rashford can play really well internationally I think that Sterling can inject so much pace and directness into any team that he he joins Henderson to to have coming on would be amazing as like a stabilizing factor of midfield and you know I think the defense is all to play for really with Ben Chilwell on the left you know Reese James on the right and and Tyron Mings in the midfield sorry in in the middle of the back as well I think he (laughs) can easily (laughs) Tyron Mings sent to me confirmed um I would happily put Tyron Mings in over someone like Harry Maguire Personally. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, my my um, shout, what I would have wanted, would be Ming's concert because I think they've been so good together for for Villa this season. But um, but the squad does not permit me to make such radical changes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think there is a lot of exciting to go on, even in terms of like you know Dominic Calvert Lewin being in that squad and what he offers that's quite similar to Harry Kane, but also what he offers that's absolutely completely different and how that could help us switch up games and if we'll see them start together at all or if we'll see them make a direct sub or if we'll see them so one come on. Uh, come on to play alongside Kane it's going to be very very interesting in terms of the options it provides us going forwards yeah definitely I mean what's really cool about this is like take out all of that front three that we said and you bring in Jaden Sancho Raheem Sterling and DCL I think that again is a really cool exciting because also they they play to each other's strengths Raheem Sterling is great against the ball and putting balls in Sancho again is a really good direct dribbler who creates chances and for someone like DCL who's just going to sit in the box and mop them up in, as good as any player can do. That again is exciting. I want it. I want to see it. I just I, what I really want to see is like England field two teams <laughs> <laughs> meet in the final. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, well, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves now. We will have to postpone um, our league table stuff for next week. Because I think we're about coming to time. Uh, unless there's anything I've missed out on. Cam, that I believe is everything. Um, well, but it's been great to talk to you. And you as well. And we'll catch you all next time. Thanks for listening. Cheers, guys. Bye.